Well, humanity is not built to comprehend space. In the deep cosmos, time works on a scale of millions and billions of years, while space is measured in parsecs and light years rather than miles or kilometers. We humans are stranded on a planet that's barely larger than the head of a pin, and our lives and our entire civilization will begin and end in a span of time that is utterly inconsequential when compared to the magnitude of the universe. Comforting thought, isn't it? As much as humanity's brightest minds might be able to reason with the universe in abstraction, and as much as any one of us can achieve at least a limited understanding of our place in that great cosmic balance, we are utterly unprepared to reckon with the sheer scale of what surrounds us. Perhaps it's that entirely lack of human comprehension that has led most people on Earth to become obsessed with one mind-blowing question. Where is everybody? Humanity is not known to have had contact with any extraterrestrial intelligence. Humanity is not known to have record of any life in a place beyond our own. But the idea that humans and earthly life might be alone is actually incredibly unlikely, with billions of stars just in our galaxy and a very high likelihood that many of these stars have rocky, habitable planets and moons and a time scale of billions upon billions of years to work with, do you really believe that the combination of factors required to create life has happened only once? And in considering those questions, well, congratulations, space philosopher, you've just stumbled into the Fermi Paradox. The exercise in mental gymnastics known as the Fermi Paradox traces its history all the way back to a Soviet rocket scientist called Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who postulated that the reason that people deny the existence of extraterrestrial life is A, they hadn't come to visit Earth, and B, uh, they hadn't given Earth any sign of their existence. For Tsiolkovsky, this created a bit of a logical paradox. After all, people just saw these facts and assumed that extraterrestrial life didn't exist exist when in reality they hadn't worked out all of the other logical options. Solovsky's take was that humankind might in fact be known and observed by other civilizations, but that those civilizations didn't believe that humans were ready to come and participate in whatever interstellar order that they'd got going on. Alongside Solkovsky, other theorists had speculated on the so-called Silentium Universi, the silence of the universe, and the strangeness of the reality that humans have found no neighbor amongst the stars. But the the moment that the Fermi Paradox really became something came at the summer of 1950 at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the US state of New Mexico. There, an astrophysicist and astronomy goat named Enrico Fermi was having lunch with a few fellow colleagues and couldn't resist the temptation to blurt out a question that nobody could answer. The people who enjoyed lunch with him remembered it differently, but one telling of Fermi's question has stuck. Where is everybody? Fermi was asking, nay, begging for a resolution to Silentium Universi, the inexplicable loneliness of humanity's cradle amongst the stars that could be teeming with life, and when none of his companions could answer him, he got to thinking. Now, Fermi would die of cancer a few years later in 1954, probably as a direct result of the work that he'd done on nuclear physics while standing next to a large, unshielded pile of radioactive material. But before his untimely demise, he did a few calculations on probability in order to try and work out just how likely life in the Milky Way should be and just how feasible it is that an advanced civilization could, hypothetically, stumble across Earth. He understood that any civilization with a halfway decent understanding of rocket technology, probably along the lines of what humans will have in their disposal in the next one to two hundred years should be more than capable of colonizing an entire galaxy in the span of a few tens of millions of years if they had the will or the incentive to do so. And without a statement, two things are also true. That timeline can accelerate if such a civilization continued advancing its technology, and it would only take one such civilization to spread throughout the stars in the Milky Way's entire history. And compared to the Milky Way's age, those tens of millions of years are a blink of an eye, roughly equivalent to a few months' time out of a healthy human lifespan. Add to that the implications of a few other scientific theories, like the Kardashev scale, the limitations of travel at below the speed of light, and the expected benefits of nuclear fusion technology, and Fermi's argument ends up being incredibly hard to shake. And not only is it a massive pain in the ass for anyone wondering about extraterrestrial life, but it presents a paradox that scientists have struggled to address in many ways. To help understand this problem a little better, we turn to the work of American astrophysicist Frank Drake, who formulated an equation known as the Drake Equation in 1961. The Drake Equation is an attempt to approximate the rough number of advanced civilizations in the Milky Way. That is, civilizations that are active in interstellar space and are willing to communicate or otherwise announce their existence. Now, for the non-mathematically inclined among us, we do ask you to try and explore the Drake Equation with us because it's probably one of the more interesting forms of mathematics that we're ever likely to find. What the Drake Equation does 
is try and establish a range of factors that are necessary to proceed down the pathway from space dust to extraterrestrial empire and put a reasonably precise probability of each of those factors happening. To do that, the equation establishes a logical chain, and it goes something like this. There is an average rate of star formation in the Milky Way, thus indicating a certain number of stars that should be going through stable, sun-like parts of their lifespan at any given time. Of those stars, a certain number can have planets. And for those of you thinking to yourselves that moons can support life too, well, you're absolutely right, but let's not deal with that for now. Of those planets that orbit stars, a certain proportion will be in their stars' habitable zones, and we're actually going to step outside of the standard Drake equation here to break this down into two more steps that a lot of theorists have found useful. A certain proportion of those habitable zone planets are going to have liquid water, and a certain proportion of those are going to have what we'll term as all the right conditions to establish life. Then, returning to the Drake equation, we'll come to what we call these perfect planets, and we find a proportion of those planets that actually develop life. From there, we've got to establish a proportion of planets with life that develops intelligent life, and of the planets that develop intelligent life, we've got to establish the percentage that develop into civilizations with the potential to release detectable signs of their existence into space. Then we have to add a final factor, the length of time that a given civilization will be broadcasting into space before something comes along to make them stop doing that. It is an equation with a lot of potential and a few key problems, the main one of which is that we don't actually know all of the values that we need. We think we know some of them, for example, the rate of star formation and the abundance of planets around stars, but for some of them, we have absolutely no data, including all of those relating to the development of life. For all those metrics, we've got a sample size of one, planet Earth, and we're not even sure about all the stuff that we need to understand in order to map our own history. That means that the Drake equation can be used by both people who want to emphasize the potential abundance of extraterrestrial life and people who want to insinuate that we are really alone. At the first scientific meeting of SETI, an organization that searches for intelligent extraterrestrial life, a panel of 10 scientists, including Frank Drake and Carl Sagan, used the Drake equation to make their own postulates on a number of civilizations that could be out there there, but their numbers went from as low as a thousand to as high as 100 million. To illustrate, let's take a relatively common approach, which is to take the overall number of stars in the Milky Way and establish a likelihood of 10% at each following stage of the Drake equation. So taking a low estimate, let's say that there are 100 billion stars in this galaxy. If 10% of those have planets and 10% of those planets are habitable, 10% of those have water and otherwise favorable conditions for life, and 10% of those actually end up developing life, then we've got to 10 million planets in the Milky Way that have at some point hosted life. Say that 10% of those develop intelligent life, which by the way gives us a million intelligent species at least, and that 10% of those eventually learn how to broadcast their existence into space, and just for fun, let's add another confounding variable that not one in ten, but one in a hundred have the desire to become space-bearing empires. In order to explain the actual implications of that maths, we're going to put ourselves into the shoes of a frustrated, curious astrophysicist and present ourselves with the following question. Do you really mean to tell me that in all this godforsaken, abandoned galaxy, 1,000 advanced civilizations have, at one point or another, spread throughout the stars? Do you really mean to tell me that in a galaxy where each of those alien colonies can continue onward, each of them can continue to explore, and each of them will have spread through the galaxy at different times, that they somehow have entirely failed to visit our corner of the Milky Way? Do you truly mean to tell me that of a thousand civilizations, each lasting tens of millions of years, that nobody, nowhere, has bothered to even say hello? The Great Filter. Now, we hope by this point that it's abundantly clear that the Fermi Paradox has got some teeth to it, and while we didn't give you quite the most conservative estimates that are out there, we did come pretty close. Many theories put the number of civilizations a whole lot higher than we did, or leave out some of those extra qualifiers, like the presence of liquid water or the will to explore the galaxy that uh, we decided to add in ourselves. Each time a number shifts in a slightly more positive direction, the result is a change in orders of magnitude. A 2016 paper by Adam Frank and Woodruff T. Sullivan took it a step further, trying to to determine just how unlikely it is that in all the universe's history, humans have been the only case of advanced civilization. Their answer? There is a 1 in 10 billion trillion chance that no other advanced civilization has ever developed on a habitable planet. In the Milky Way, the odds are as extreme as a 1 in 60 billion probability of the same. But even with these kinds of odds, we still have to grapple with the reality that's at the heart of the Drake equation. We haven't found any evidence of the existence of extraterrestrial life, and unless this ongoing UAP investigation gets extremely spicy sometime soon, we probably aren't going to find any such evidence anytime soon. 
So how do we reconcile that fact with the apparently extreme unlikelihood that human civilization is truly unique or with the abundance of other advanced civilizations that the odds suggest have traveled among the stars? For an answer, we turn not to a dyed-in-the-wool astrophysicist, but to an economist named Robin Hanson, who today teaches economics at George Mason University and conducts research through Oxford. Hanson is an expert in prediction markets, or that is, markets that use money to endorse the predictions of certain outcomes. Like, for instance, placing a bet that the Chicago Cubs might for once not absolutely suck at playing baseball. He's invented economic market rules, he's done some really cool work for DARPA, and in 1996 he proposed a solution to explain the incongruencies in with the Fermi paradox. He called it the Great Filter. In a nutshell, the Great Filter is a sort of code word used to represent an unknown natural phenomenon, and specifically a phenomenon that would radically change our mathematics about how hard it is to become an advanced civilization. This phenomenon could happen at any number of unspecified points in the evolution of a species, and because, again, we humans have a sample size of exactly one species, we can't really put a finger on just what that phenomenon could be. Whatever it is, the Great Filter is basically a choke point. That is to say, it's the threshold before which either the favorable conditions for life or life itself can flourish, but once a planet or a life form hits it, there's no real possibility that the process of advancement towards advanced civilization would continue. Of all the possibilities on what the Great Filter might be, the most obvious is a phenomenon called abiogenesis, which is the process by which we're pretty sure lifeless matter eventually formed its way into living matter here on Earth. This is a pretty complex process involving a whole bunch of chemistry that we're not going to get into, but the main takeaway is that it involves a lot of things happening in precisely the correct order, or else life doesn't develop at all. If abiogenesis is indeed the Great Filter, then that would imply a great many habitable worlds in the Milky Way, and only a fraction of them actually managing to develop life at all. Aside from abiogenesis, there are plenty of competing hypotheses. Perhaps it's really rare for cells inside a given multicellular organism to specialize, and the building blocks for things like blood cells or neurons don't end up forming in most cases. Or perhaps it's rare for a brain to develop at such a level of complexity that it really gains what we would call consciousness or self-awareness or curiosity. Perhaps humans got very lucky to evolve in a time when there weren't enough massive predators to finish us off, when in most cases predatory life is a lot more common than it is here on Earth. Or maybe Earth exists in an exceptionally friendly corner of the galaxy, while everywhere else asteroid impacts or chaos-inducing flybys from rogue planets turn everything on its head much more frequently than they do here. Or there's another possibility. The civilizations gain the means to destroy themselves and usually do so. Perhaps the first cultural exchange between long-separated people, like the Columbia Exchange between the New World and the Old World on Earth, usually ends with such rampant diseases transferred to both sides that they wipe each other out, but we just got lucky. Or perhaps it's exceptionally unlikely for a species to gain control of nuclear technology without annihilating themselves. Maybe civilizations have a tendency to play too hard too fast with AI, like we are here on Earth might be doing, and create a killer supercomputer or a doomsday machine that they can't control. Whatever the Great Filter is, it provides a very low probability on one step of the Drake equation, thus drastically cutting down the likelihood of an advanced spacefaring civilization developing at all. And of course, there doesn't have to just be one Great Filter either. Perhaps there's a one in a million chance that an Earth-like planet develops life at all, one in a million chance that rare life becomes intelligent, and a one in a million chance that intelligent life spreads itself across the stars before it nukes itself to oblivion. Luckily, we've also got some pretty decent ideas about what the Great Filter is not. A lot of the work on that question comes from astrobiologists Dirk schultz machuk and William Baines, who've offered the interesting point that convergent evolution here on Earth has resulted in a lot of different forms of life, along different evolutionary pathways, picking up some of the same skills. For example, crows, octopi, and orangutans can all use tools despite developing those abilities completely separately, suggesting that the feat of learning to use tools probably isn't going to be a great filter by itself. The same goes for single-celled organisms growing into multi-celled organisms and things like that. Unfortunately, convergent evolution can only take us so far. After all, the end point of convergent evolution seems to be carcinization, which is the evolutionary rule that everything eventually becomes a crab, but we'll keep on the lookout for crab aliens, knock it out, or just in case. The Great Filter comes with some pretty serious implications for humanity, concerns that can be summed up in a fairly straightforward question. If the Great Filter does exist, is it behind us, 
or is it in front of us? A great filter that would be behind us might be something like abiogenesis, something that life on Earth has already done, leaving the way clear in a probabilistic sense for humans to expand civilization through the cosmos if we choose to. But if the great filter is in front of us, then that's potentially catastrophic news, implying that an unknown something is still on the horizon that's going to eventually either wipe us all out or otherwise ensure that we never travel far in space. If the great filter really does lie ahead, then we can reasonably guess that if humanity flirtation with AI will spin out of control, or that World War III is unavoidable, or that by learning how to harness antibiotics and force bacterial evolution, we condemn ourselves to a world-ending superbug that will arise sometime soon. There are plenty of ways for it all to end. Perhaps the Great Filter is a lot more innocuous than we think, though, and it's just very unlikely for any civilization to have a real appetite for space exploration. Or perhaps the Great Filter isn't a Great Filter at all, but a great enemy, some other civilization that's already spread itself throughout space, but chooses for some reason to keep itself and every Everybody else quiet and on their own planets. If a great filter does exist, then it opens up a higher likelihood that, that humanity could be alone, or at least that we're the only civilization to pass through its constraints in a very long time. If that's the case, we might find the remnants of other civilizations eventually, perhaps in dysfunctional probes or other junk that happens upon us from deep space, or in the constructions and monuments left behind on worlds that we might eventually settle. But more likely, we would find very little to suggest that anyone else has ever existed. If the Great Filter lies ahead, then we'd be more likely to find either a teeming extraterrestrial environment, which we haven't, or an intergalactic graveyard full of warning signs from other species that had it all and lost it all. If we get really lucky, perhaps someone will have thought to leave us humans a note about what not to do. But more likely, we'll just find a whole lot of unmarked graves left by beings who didn't comprehend their impending doom until it was too late. When it comes to solving this problem and solving the Fermi Paradox, there are a couple of places to start, but they all involve the same basic goal. To establish more concrete, probabilistic estimates of just how likely each step is on the path to spacefaring civilization. That mission will involve methods of anthropology and archaeology, digging deep into human history and figuring out just how difficult it was for our own civilization to pass each interval of development. It'll involve methods of biology and chemistry, nailing down the likelihood of abiogenesis, and running large-scale experimentation on how common it is for multicellular life to evolve into beings whose cells can work together instead of simply alongside each other. It will involve elements of philosophy and political science as human theorists game out just how likely a civilization is to destroy itself. And it will, of course, involve astronomy, and a whole lot of it as we try to understand the circumstances found on exoplanets, comb the galaxy for any signs of life, and listen for the holy grail of the Fermi Paradox. A techno-signature. That is, some sign that somebody somewhere has learned how to broadcast their own existence into space so we can hear it. But no matter how far we dig into our own history or attempt to measure the universe from our perspective here on Earth, our attempts to solve the Fermi Paradox will be in vain. Well, that is, it'll be in vain until the first time that humanity hears somebody else say hello, either in real time or in the traces of a people that have long since ceased to exist.